Welcome everyone and thank you. So it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Alejandro Del Pozo um, from Virginia Tech. So uh, Alejandro and I overlapped in graduate school and so that's the first time our paths crossed. Um, but he has ventured all over the place and through lots of different cropping systems. So I'm excited to hear about um, his experiences today. So um, when I was working on my PhD in Idaho, Alejandro was working at WSU um, towards his master's with poplars, hybrid poplar production. And then he moved to NC State and worked in, what did you say, cotton and soybean? Well, started with soybean and then moved to cotton and corn. At cotton and corn. And then from there, he got a position with the um, Cooperative Extension in California and yeah. started working in fruits and vegetables, maybe? Vegetables. 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 Okay. And now he has a very long title that um, allows him the opportunity to work in an extension and research position across a lot of those commodities and turf, okay. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so it is my pleasure to turn it over to Alejandro. Thank you for everyone who is attending and visiting with him today. And please go ahead. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for that introduction. That was phenomenal. Um, and thank you, everybody, to be here today. I am excited to share some of my experiences and a little bit of the efforts that I'm trying to. So I, I titled this presentation, Expanded the Toolbox. Um, a little more on the spectrum being really applied. Extinction is one of my passions, but also I am devoted to uh, provide science-based solutions to growers where everywhere that I go, that's, that's kind of like my mission. So. Locally, I am in a new position right now, as, as, as Laura was, was pointed it out. So um, let's, let's share that information and hopefully we can have a, a nice conversation after that. So, and, and the one is, I'll, I'm gonna show to you the applied research that I, I've been doing for a while, especially if you wanna use some um, uh, study cases. But I wanna start, you know, you need a, an army to build a village and I made this on purpose and I'm missing out a bunch of people, but I just want to acknowledge that I have throughout my career, I have all this really nice network and support team and also collaborators and people that work with me in terms of getting all these uh, projects done. So I, I'm their funding agencies and, 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 team, and team members as well. So I'm gonna use, I'm, I'm native from Peru, uh, South America. I'm gonna use my background to kind of like set up the framework about you know, this seminar. And I'm gonna talk about uh, my experience as a grower in Aspire, so I, that's how I started. And then as uh, I move on to soybeans for my PhD, and also gonna mention that. And then I'm gonna transition to something I'm, that I'm passionate about, you know, IPM, Integrated Pest Management. It's, it's the ultimate goal, at least in, in my program, to uh, provide those solutions to, to growers that are, you know, struggling with emerging pests, invasive pests, and, and they're trying to promote a more sustainable approach to pest management. And I wasn't mentioning it before, I'm gonna use specialty crops because I've been involved in specialty crops since the past uh, three years. And I'm gonna use vegetables in the Salinas Valley as one of the examples, just to showcase what this alternative control tactics could be, you know, showcase and deploy in order to uh, expand the toolbox for, for, for establishing an IPM problem. And now I'm gonna show you a little bit of my recent work in ornamentals uh, here now in Virginia Tech and where it kind of like, and talk a little bit about how my program is gonna, you know, the vision of my program since I just started in this position. So just jump in. This is a beautiful shot of one of the Aspirus farms that I used to manage back then in the 2000s, the early 2000s. That's uh, the name of the farm, it's Mar Verde. And, and that means the green ocean. So this center road from to the right, you're looking at 6,000 acres of aspirants, just a monoculture. Uh, across that line, there's a tree line here, that's avocado across the, the that's the, one of the main highways that cross from north to south Peru, the whole country. 
So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of action. No, that's not a spot on your screen, that's a bird. Uh, there is a high boy spraying a fungicide in here, more likely. I don't, I'm not making this up, that was, that's an spraying. And here we have some molassa traps, uh, use it to attract some of the adults. Uh, this was a single grower, so it was a big company, Horizontal Integrated. I moved my way, so I started as a scouter, uh, and then I worked my way up, and I was able to do some management. Uh, it was, as a company, we got several growers, so I provided the crop, the plant and crop protection, so I was in charge of taking care of uh, pests and diseases and weeds as well. Uh, it was really empirical. It was, we, we got some information. And when you have this company, you outsource the consulting. So you bring from, uh, consultants from all over the world. I never forget about, about, I was the very few people that, you know, speak English, spoke English back then. And one of the scientists from Florida came and visited us. And he was amazed by the, 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 the things that we were doing. So, uh, and he helped us a lot with a bunch of different diseases, things that we have. But anyway, so the goal was to do the management. Uh, and we have to get creative. And that's where I actually learned. That's, uh, that was my passion, just trying to understand ecology and biology and do something about it, do something practical. And since you are in a commodity, you are in a specialty crop, you have this cushion of economics that you can explore this. So let me walk you through this. So some of the control tactics that we came up as a team, you know, there was a team. So these are, this is a sticky surface. That's a lot of plastic. If you're concerned about the plastic, you recycle all this. So this, this plastic lasts for, at least two to three years before we send it to recycle. And that was coated with soybean oil just to make it as sticky. And then along the lines there were, you know, black lights attracting. So we have issues with cecidomai that was attracted to uh, the black light and, and they cre create some of the problems with as far as spears. Uh, we use that as a control. And then I know you heard about Pegasus, the mythological Greek wing horse well, that's the Peruvian version of the Pegasus. So we created something for Wi-Fi control using organic uh, soybean oil. We coated this and we have, you know, a family owned local that have these horses and the horses will go through the, through the asparagus and collecting thousands of thousands of adults before we actually spray something. Actually, we never, during my time, the six years that I worked in that company uh, doing pest control, uh, we never spray for, for Wi-Fi, and we did have a Wi-Fi issue. Uh, cultural controls and, you know, soaps and things like that would help us uh, manage that population. And then here on the left side, you see someone fully, you know, wearing PPE, and that's for uh, a fungus, uh, Pycelomyces, going injected through the drip lots and actually just trying to mitigate some of the nematode populations that we have there the root knot nematode, it was big in us like this. And then we also have a massive group of people, like hundreds of people actually working and releasing beneficials. You see one of those guys right now releasing trichogramma. So we were able to record back then that we're up to 30% of our citizen rates in fields where we able to do that. So we have, we started an in-house trichogramma reading facility and then we outsourced that and somebody else as a private company took it. And then at the end, we needed to pull the trigger. We have that's a high boy, you know, spraying it uh, an insecticide just to control something that get out of hand. Then with that background, back in, in Peru, I was really interested in understanding the why. Why happened, why the ecology, why all that? And I think it was a, a nice move and transition for me having all that experience coming back to the United States and try to understand you know, the systems and pest management. And I've always been fascinated by IPM. Integrated pest management is something that has resonated with me since I started. So when I got my opportunity in, at NC State, uh, there was an invasive species, Bengacopter cryberia. It's a, it's a, it's a platastid. It's the only platastid in the United States, originally from, you know, Southeast Asia. In and when it was first discovered in the United States, it, it, it was meant to be well, like a biological control because it was going after kutsu. The common name is the kutsu bug. So, but then uh, the kutsu bug didn't get the memo that it should have stayed on kutsu. I mean, it started, you know, transition to soy. Therefore, we got it. So growers were losing money. There was a lot of issues with the kutsu bug. So it was something that I was passionate about and the opportunity to work with, you know, a team, building a team across states 
and, and getting this as an invasive species, throwing all these different IPM strategies in order to uh, lower their power. That was my first opportunity to you know, work in extinction, work with several growers. So I transitioned my, you know, my mind as being a single grower, like an asparagus grower. Now I'm serving more growers you know, across the state. And the goal was to, to, to control this, this, this invasive that was causing so much. So within my, my PhD program, I was able to identify the drivers that influence population dynamics. So we were able to show the planting date, for example, you see here in the, on the bottom, uh, you know, egg masses, nymphs, and adults. And when you have different planting dates, that actually uh, have an effect on the population dynamics of the kutsuba, where usually, you know, uh, early planted beans will be more prone to get high infestations of the kutsuba when you compare the transition towards the later planted, like the double cropping systems, where you come with a, with a, a cereal, uh, you know, like wheat or something, and then you plant soybeans after that. Those were the ones that we were able to scout and, and, and document that there were high and low infestations of the kutsuba. And then we also build that foundation. We try to understand with all those different factors, how can we propose an IP? And definitely insecticide use was one of the primary ways that kutsuba gets made control. So we, we were able to team up with you know, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina when I was there in order to propose the action threshold. So we were able to show in the, here on the, on, on the right-hand side, you have these different treatments, a number of insects using you know, sweep nets, uh, how many of the insecticides were, were sprayed as the numbers in parentheses and how that impacts on the yield. So we were able to show that uh, using NIMS presence, so the immature presence was uh, good enough to do a natural start of treatment before having adults because the adults will migrate and move into uh, the, the soybean field. So if, you, if we keep in spraying based on adult number, we have the reinfestations and we are actually ended up having six and multiple applications on a soybean field, which is not economically viable and then impacting beneficials and a bunch of other things. So that was a neat piece of information. Uh, I learned a lot from that experience and that set me up to what, what I'm, I'm gonna be talking next because it was about IPM. And I really like this and I use this uh, metaphor or at least schematic that Professor Pettigo put it all together. I, I've been in love and fascinated about this one. So IPM is a bridge. And, and in the past, when I was a spiralous grower, I was drowning here in the river of the pest losses. And, and, and you don't wanna be there because you're losing money, you're confused, you're, you're, you're stressed out because you've seen your crop uh, being damaged. But then if you realize that you can build this bridge, which, which is IPM, this, this concept about bringing different things and what do you need to build this bridge? So the keystones are you know, the life cycle, the seasonality, the population dynamics, right? Economics are all here. And then on top of that keystones, you, you put the, the pillars, which are your control tactics. So you have the information as the base, and then you put your control tactics that works for you in order to build this bridge and cross from one side to the other. So beautiful, beautiful analogy. I feel really identified with this as a grower and also as a, as a researcher. But then, you know, things change it and, and it's, it's evolving, right? And, and I, I, I love also this uh, uh, representation of, of, a, of a new model of IPM. My colleague, uh, our colleague, you know, Surendra Padara from University of California, he come up with this uh, really, really nice way to try to summarize and it's cluttered and it's, it's, it's busy with a purpose because that helps us to understand in our first class what IPM uh, can entitle. So you have the, 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 the true, the bridge and the true things about what we learned in school and we talked about it most of the time, the pest management and the tactics. But then you, it, and Surrender also talks about the knowledge and resources that we need to understand to build an IPM program. And then planning your organizations within your, you know, your industry and then communication. So those four pillars now constitute the core of the IPM. And then on that, you have this aspect kind of like modulating how IPM is gonna get built and you have the business aspect, but also the sustainability aspect. So it, uh, if you haven't seen it, hopefully you can, you can look that up and take a, take a read of this. I, I highly encourage you, it's, it's a nice read. It, it puts it in a different perspective. And as an applied scientist, I, I really like to make these connections with the growers that I serve or I've been serving for, for, for a while.
Now that I have this framework and I have this passion about IPM, do we have an IPM for specialty jobs? I think, yes, we do. Sometimes we were eager to pull the trigger and it's more about insecticide pest management, but integrated pest management is something that it's, it could be accomplished. So based on my later experience, cultural control, biological control, and chemical control are the pillars, at least for trying to integrate the program. So within cultural control, we got agronomical practices, as I showed you before, you know, planting day, maturity group selection, tillage practices, they're gonna influence your population densities. Having that knowledge help you to understand what are your fields that are at risk? But we, so I was able to prove that, you know, and show that, in, for example, in, in the soybean system, you know, there's host plant resistance that you can incorporate that. And, and that helps you to get a, ahead of the game. But then biological control and also chemical control, some of the pillars. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. So now I'm gonna use these two specialty crops uh, systems to showcase to you what it could be, you know, incorporated to expand that toolbox that I was talking about. So this is a romaine field in Salinas, California. Uh, romaine, if you haven't tried it, it's, for me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably I'm biased now, but it, it's, it's, it's the crispiest, freshest, I don't know mm -hmm. how to say it, but it's, it's such a delicious uh, uh, lettuce. You ask it as a wedge, when you go to the restaurant, it gives you a half of the romaine heart, it's beautiful, it's tasty, you know, you get the fiber and everything. Um, maybe I'm, I'm going too, too much on terms of supporting the industry, but here is how it looked like, you know, this agroecosystem that it's a monoculture, that it's, you know, highly inputs and in high value, you have the, the harvesting crew coming in and the trucks coming out and there's a lot of intensity, a lot of people going all around. So it's a, it's, it's a system that is intense. And due to that intensity, you know, the herbivores are also present. So here's an example, what it looks like a healthy lettuce compared to a hot, highly infested lettuce with aphids. Lettuce aphid, Nasanovia genus, it's the one that primary, uh, Nasanovia rebus nigri is the one that actually goes. Aphids are the major, one of the major key pests uh, for lettuce uh, in, in California. We also have thrips, uh, Western flower thrips, and they have both the direct and indirect damage. So for example, growers need to juggle if they need to export to Taiwan, Taiwan has zero tolerance for Western flower thrips. So you as a grower have to walk around those things and, and, and pass inspections. So there is a direct damage to that. But uh, recently I team up with, before I left, uh, I team up with uh, USDA scientists here at the Indian House at our actually who took those pictures. Uh, trying to understand, we have a toast providers that is going after uh, the lettuce. You see here how the toast providers all the new crosses when you got an infected lettuce. And this is how it resulted. So we were able to document, and we're working on a paper that we want to publish pretty soon, but uh, we were able to document that you can, you can have 100% loss. So for a commodity, you know, like, like, a, like a specialty crop, that's not tolerable. So you got this pressure of the, of, of the in this case, the thrips that are going after that. And then for both crops, diamond back moth, it's, it's, it's the key pass, you know, they're, they're, you know, Brussels sprouts that can go up to 17 applications, 40 insecticide applications in a season for like up to five months. So just picture how, you know, these populations could be and, 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 and how pressing they are. So you can have this whole holes and, 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 and the leaves, but this is not really necessarily what it, it actually, um, they get concerned about it. it's when those caterpillars move to the heads and you have a final problem and they start eating the head. So you need to be controlling clean quotation marks and have a, the lowest amount of uh, caterpillars when you move into that to that you know head formation. So to learn from the system, what I did first is trying to team up with growers and they gave me this small space under their commercial fields. Just and I think uh, it was a, a best way for me to learn from the system doing all this efficacy trial. So with the chemicals, in the back of my mind, I wanted to find alternatives besides pyrethroids and neonics and see if those alternative chemicals will be able to provide you know, the, the, the control for, for this grower. So uh, this is a shot of the, of a, this is a commercial field of, of romaine lettuce. Uh, and then we have all these different multi, you know, multi-locations multi and, and throughout the years that we, we did some uh, field, small field plots. And then what happened is, Surprisingly enough, these chemicals were able to lower the populations. And here I have an arrow. I always have this grower standard. 
since there's some privacy uh, compliance that we have with, you know, because that's a highly competitive industry, at least for vegetables, uh, the growers will not tell me what they can spread. But locally, I was able to show them with all these replicated trials that they were doing a phenomenal job, you know, being on time because you scout this, this fields twice a week. So there's people actually going and walking and monitoring. So there is, there is not need for being uh, prevented. It is always, depending on your population, they will be able to push it out. So I was learning about that and I was, you know, firsthanded getting that information is like, oh my God, so this in the books says that you have to, to scout. So that's how you do it. So that's how scouting is part of this story, right? So, and then I, after that, telling them, hey, look, when you spray, you, you're, you're, you're doing it, you're on top of, you're keeping up that and, and, and not letting it become an issue. So they were uh, eager to learn about that, that they were doing a good job. So a palm in the shoulder was always good. Uh, but then you're using a lot, a lot of insecticides, right? So the system is inundated with insecticides. So what ended up happening is the, the, the non-target effects. So, and basically one of the biggest constraints right now for using pesticides, and this is something that, you know, California is taking a look at it. And we here in Virginia also will start looking at, at it as, as and the, the pesticide ended is on surface water. And that's an issue. So here's some data, 2017, that's the last one that I was able to, to get it from. Uh, Dr. Dan and in the, in, in the uh, Department of um, uh, Pesticide Regulations in California. So you here see the proportion of uh, detections of multiple, and, and this is in the Salinas Valley, so they go collect water and they, they run it in the lab. And then the blue bars are the ones that are detected. So these are the chemicals, the active ingredients that are detected. So there's some neonics and pyrethroid, you, you see that. And here's 80% of the sample. Or here and then 2017, 80% of the sample have it like imidacloprid on it, detected. And those 80% were all exceedances. So EPA provides a benchmark to say, this is the amount that it's gonna, we expect it to see presence and it's not gonna have an, an impact on, on, on the, you know, the organisms that we get. But if you're taking a look at this, those are the two ones that actually you detected and you have high levels of that, so that 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 is, that is a problem. So that opens an opportunity. So I feel I feel a little bit privileged and also happy and excited that that is an opportunity. That's that's something that let it open a little door for this new technique, this new technologies, and something that I'm also passionate about to bring it back to the picture, put it on the shelf, and say, look, there are new things that you can try it out because you are getting into this. There are pesticide regulations. And that's that's something that we, we, we as a community we have to face and work around. So, you know, the bans for neonics, for example. EPA now it's, it's taking a revision of neonics and there's some proposed uh, changes in labels and uses. So farmers are gonna, are gonna be impacted, impacted. Neonics are, are an important control tactic. So can we preserve that? Can we actually use it in a different way in order to have that technology long lasting when we need it? So. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, and I was able to, you know, get some project going on in order to expand those alternatives. Uh, the first one, it's bringing remote sensing and remote monitoring uh, to, uh, to Salinas, and I team up with TrapView, a company, and this is just what they call Smart Trap, and basically it's a high-resolution camera on top, this is a thermal uh, trap, and the only, uh, the only uh, difference is that you're taking pictures every day and that sends to the computer. Computer recognizes, so here's the map. So they're geo-referenced and then you get this alerts to your phone that you get it every day. So that uh, the, the counterpart, the growers will say, well, Alejandro, a thermal job doesn't work because we have to wait for seven days to get the data. Well, with this technology, you have daily uh, you know, alerts. It stress you more, but if you if you are able to manage that those layers of information, which you know we're getting better at that with some resource planning platforms, it could be really beneficial. So that's why we're saying so that the picture gets stitched out, send it to the computer, it recognizes so the thicker here the uh, those squares are the new captures that the computer recognizes for that night, and then the thinner ones that you probably can see here are the ones from the previous pass, and then the computer makes the total counts and then subtract it from the previous night and you get the alert for the difference on your phone. Pretty nice. And I'll be teaming up with Trapview again, we're gonna do fall army one here for turf grass. 
Uh, we also, we were concerned about the design. So we uh, used the regular cardboard traps paired within a mile to this uh, automated traps. And we were able to prove that there was no significant differences in, in terms of when we compared that, uh, meaning that there is not a preference sort of like influence depending on the design or the type of the trap. So that was encouraging for trap you to get on and get the finalize the design and actually start promoting this technology to you know a vessel rowers to trying to go after time on that mode the, 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 with the pheromone. Then trips and trips are there were also a problem and therefore here's an example of how the alerts were sent out to the rowers. So the bigger the the bubble, the more population. So we were able to see that some of the uh, fields that we scouted, when you pass the 100, like the 50 uh, marks per tips per car was something like we consider a hotspot. So we were able to send those alerts that people will do scouting around those hotspots. Uh, we got this area-wide monitoring program. And while I was about it, I'm not gonna read it now, but the idea is that this grower actually send me an email, say, hey, Alejandro, would you mind sharing with me that information that you present? That was the, name, the nicest thing that happened to me. So I was like, you clicked on me, and the people actually looking at this data and actually using this data to, you know, with some financial implications about, you know, the profit of the company and just trying to explain to the buyers that they have these hotspots based on our monitoring data. And then we're trying to work around those things and trying to explain that they're doing their best they could to manage those populations but they have that data across the valley that show them how the, the pressure was. So that was pretty neat to get this email and say like, it's totally worth it. So I, I wanted to keep it up providing that service. And I'm also doing that right now in Virginia where we're sending those alerts to well, different pests. Now. These are the overlooked guys. The good guys are the overlooked, the ones that are actually naturally occurred. So the next pillar of biology will control sometimes you take it, it, it takes it for granted. You know, I have this, this nice conversation in the morning with Dr. Kaplan that we notice when they're gone, that's when we start noticing that they're, they're, there's a missing portion. So uh, these are the ones that we have ladybugs, lace wings, uh, but the, the king and queen is the surface flies, at least in vegetables in a cooler climate like Salinas Valley in California. So I was able to team up with growers and we did some really uh, uh, trials, but I want you to explain to you that as we speak, Commercial growers in Salinas use insectary plants as a way to attract beneficials. So these are the two methodologies that they use. These are commercial fields. I'm not making this out. This is not Photoshop. Uh, this is what you, when you go to Salinas, you'll see organic growers having this strip of sweet that listen, a, a, a crucifer uh, that helps you to attract the beneficials. And this is what they call scatter when they transplant. So they put the sweet that listen into the, into the field. And then what happened is previous researchers so when I was there, uh, they were able to do these gardens and try all these different plants and see which one attracted them also. Back from Dr. Cheney back then in the 98, he was able to pull, you know, up to 19 different plants. And here, you know, Sweet Alice and Nemophilia, Layla, Cilantro, and Chevrolet were the ones that on the, on the black bars attracted and recruited more beneficials. And, and there's some literature that says about, you know, the wide and the shape of the flower that actually promotes at least the presence of serpent plants. And that was the target, that was the main one. How can we promote the presence of surface flies and, and lettuce? So I team up with, uh, with 12 different growers and we have four areas in Salinas. Uh, and when we documented the presence of aphids and beneficials uh, in, in fields, commercial fields, that has no insectary plants and then a lesson and also some mixtures between a lesson and something else. And what we were able to see the trend, at least our preliminary results show that overall, when you have the, uh, the, the comparisons, the, the fields that have a listen as the strips were the ones that have, they tended to have the, the fewer amount of aphids. Uh, and here's, a, it, there's so many variables that we need to, uh, to take it with a, with a grain of salt, you know, applications and things. But assuming that they're all spraying the same and they're spraying a lot, uh, and they're also diversity around it. If we assume that those can be controlled, at least we see some trends explaining that, or at least showing preliminary that uh, those fields with uh, sweet listen have the fewer amount of aphids. And, and therefore, you know, the vegetable growers are not that crazy. And the previous data also support this. So we were happy to pull back in those extinction talks and say, look, this is some data that now it's happening to you right now. You know, back in the 90s when this was visited, 
we did a like, refresh this whole uh, approach and, and growers were happy and eager to see that and, and, and able to incorporate it again. Uh, all right, so I'm getting, I'm getting to it. So, and now we got drones and new technology that we can use. Remember I presented to you back in my, in my Stargos farm, we use a bunch of people, like hundreds of people that were shaking all these beneficials. Well, now we can use drones. So this is Kevin Hill with Parabot. Uh, and we're using drones to release beneficials. I'm gonna, I have a project coming up here to do some of those releases and try to understand. So here's, here's Kevin loading up rice holes as an inner material and then putting lace wing eggs. Yeah. So, and then you're gonna see, this is a 360 video that we took it that day. The basically what happened is that this, this is set up and it was calculated and then got these drones rolling around and you see how the rice holes are dropping from the sky and this and these are the beneficials mixed with it that we can we can release using drones and uh, we got a, we have a paper coming up with that and I'm gonna talk to you about that. So so what happened is growers as we also speak, uh, their their organic growers are releasing beneficials on a weekly basis because they see benefit on rele uh, releasing these beneficials in their, in their farms. So usually they can do interiors, they can do around the perimeter of, the, of some of the hot spots that they have, and they mainly releasing lace wings, uh, but there's some conversations about releasing my new box. it's a little bit expensive, and I'm least spread or it might to lower thrips populations. Uh, so I w when I came in, I was able to tell them that quality control is really important. Based on my previous experience in the Aspartos company, uh, it's crucial that you start with a high quality product. So we were able to kind of like test them out randomly when they're getting some shipments. And we developed it, this is an ELISA plug. We developed some like a quick and dirty kind of like essay when they pull randomly uh, eggs uh, in the office, they seal it out and then for 48 hours, they see eclosion. Basically, we were able to show them that there have really, you know, the laboratories that are sending and selling these products they're pretty good. They're, they're above 90% of the eclosion rates. It's something that, that we expect since we're paying a lot of money. And then also we talked a lot with you know, the extension talks about, you know, the delivering of this since it's a living organism. So it's, it's, a, it's an overnight who is in charge of picking them up. So all these crinks and kinks have to be spelled out and talked out loud in order to understand. It's not an easy, straightforward. I have a yard, I open them up, put it on the sprayer, go. So, that's probably something that was the biggest barrier or having augmentative biological control, you know, rates and distribution, and then also what to look for. So here is a first instar lace wing, and that's a tip of a pencil. So training the growers and the, and the scouters to recognize those things was also kind of like a, a challenge, but a rewarding uh, event. Uh, we team up with them and show them about this release with the beneficials, uh, as, a, as you saw in the, in the video, about, you know, going on top of the crops uh, dropping the rice holes with the, and we were able to put some collection stations. We were able to recover those rice holes. And then when we looked at under the stereoscope, we were able to see those eggs from those collections. And then we took those eggs to do the Eliza Petri dishes, um, you know, eclosion bioassays, and they were viable. So it was a nice way to show them though, the whole process and tell them that, yes, that they're, they're getting into the plants. And then I team up with a couple of growers as well. We have four different fields and we were able to show at least preliminary that we, uh, when you release beneficials, there is an impact on AP populations. You, uh, here you see four different fields. Uh, we have some issues in this second field because there was some slow that we, well, we needed to go through. The drone had some issues. So that's kind of like a biggest constraint. And then in the other fields, we were able to show uh, a reduction or at least you know, after the treatment, we see some reduction as well uh, uh, with the beneficials, but we also have the Pyganic, which is by uh, organic certified that we spray as, uh, as, a, as a treatment as well, and we compare that. So we were really uh, uh, excited to see this, at least preliminary that's, that has that. Well, then COVID hits, we couldn't do the second year, and, but I'm eager and, and passionate about replicating those trials here in, in Virginia and trying to see if there is any route that we can go pursue this a little bit further in terms of releasing beneficials with that. Now, the third portion of the bringing new technology is, is precision spray. So now we're talking about spray pesticides on the plant level. So here is a video. 
about a machine who has a computer on the back and he's using all these different cameras and you see how this is lettuce and he gets this whole band. It's a uh, highly concentrated fertilizer plus and a herbicide that's thinning, so killing that lettuce. But then this cross band is an application of a neonic uh, in a pyrethroid with a fungicide for that specific plant. So instead of doing broadcast applications, now there's technology to help us to do spraying at a plant level. And now we got this new technology coming out, so automated robots that are actually weeding the vegetables. And there's many, so cantaloupes, then, uh, and, you know, and now they have NDVI uh, vision. They can tell you if there's any stressors that can go there. And you can see this robot going and actually using mechanical weeding in order to uh, take those weeds out. So the company will put spraying nozzles, bodies on that, so you can also spray it at the plant level. So the future, it's amazing. And, and, and we as entomologists, we're, we're gonna be playing a crucial role to validate all those technologies. And I was able to do some preliminary work, but then again, he got so frustrated about you know this pandemic. But anyway, so so far I throw you all these different pieces and I seem, and I'm, is Alejandro a little bit lost on these things? He's just like piecing all this together. He was all over the place. But locally, I was able to find my, my true north. And the idea was that these pillars across systems, across the stakeholders, or across the best issues, you know, biology monitoring is something core that I'm interested in and I was able to, you know, some, some research on. Cultural and biological control is something also that my program uh, has been doing, you know, in different commodities. And then chemical control and the, and, and, and the threat of insecticide resistance is something that we, we also, and, and, and I'm passionate about, interested in trying to find alternatives, at least for the upcoming chemical groups that are being under regulation, which are neonics and pyrethroids. Now with my new role here in Virginia Tech, I am uh, looking at uh, ornamentals and also turf grass. So again, um, it's, it's, it's gonna be about invasive and emerging grass. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to do, now I have to statewide responsibilities, which I'm excited about. And I'm, both, I'm also going to be you know, passionate about promoting the establishment of IPN practices. Uh, here is an example, something that when I came in brand new to this lab, ambrosial beetles, bark beetles has been an issue and, and ornamental trees. So we have these two uh, insects, and this is how the toothpick kind of like, you know, think of that, well, no, the, the one that they chewed up and they start like pulling it out. Uh, because they're burrowing into uh, the, uh, the, the, the main stem. Uh, it is an issue. So growers are actually actively spraying for this. And right now we are passing the peak and, and I'll show you some data about it, but we learned that bark beetles are attracted to stress plants and the stress plants are emitting ethanol. So we, since we understand that in this system, we are using ethanol lures in order to create this monitoring you know, network in order to provide this alert to the growers. So uh, locally, my predecessor, Dr. Bill Schultz, have this beautiful data, you know, it lasts for the past 20 years. I was able to do some data mining about it and help to get the word out and then and explain the growers that the peak of activity, regardless of the year, and this one is one location, we have uh, five different locations across the state. Uh, then with, from April the 10th to May 20, 22nd, Regardless of the year, that's where you're going to see the most activity of this guy. So that first peak is actually when they concentrated their scouting. And previous to that, they're looking at and they're looking at their, uh, 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 I forgot to mention that now we're using the soda, two liter soda bottle with a thermal lure. So they, the, the, the adults get attracted and they drop into the funnel and we capture them with soapy water. And then based on that, they know when to put the, the bottles out and then went to scout. And if they wanted the treatment, they, they should be able to. Uh, so this is my last slide. Uh, I was talking about applied research and also the extension. So if, if personally, my targets have been the biology and the ecology of this, of this best or organisms that I'm studying. With. And, and the idea is to bring in and combine in this, this pest control tactic. And I'm passionate about bringing these new technologies like I showed you before, you know, drones, uh, remote sensing, uh, it also, you know, smart traps, robots spraying, spraying at the plant level, and how can we incorporate those into an IPM program? So I've always been conducting research on the field, uh, commercial field levers, has its pros and constraints, uh, but I, mean, I think the key is trying to find those 
collaborators that actually value the uh, working the working relationship with the universities. So again, the research areas that I was able to share with you, even if it seems that it's scattered all over the place, you know, bio biology and monitoring, cultural and biological control, and chemical and insecticide resistance. So uh, when I started, need assessment was something that I, I needed to do and learn about the system. So now I'm excited to start my first season here in Virginia Tech. Uh, we got several projects lined up and, and yeah, and, and I'm, I'm hoping to bring all that background and, and interest in IPM to, to help the growers here. And then ultimately provide that technical support, science-based solutions to, to the problems that, give, that we can encounter. And with that, I think that's it. Thank you, Alejandro. <laughs> that was fantastic. I love that you started with that paper by Surendra Dara about the new paradigm of IPM. It's one that I sent around the department and got my lab to read. It's really interesting and brings up sort of the new pressures and social perspectives yes. that are driving grower decisions. Yes. So one of the, for example, one, one of the comments that I always make, it's a uh, fresh press. Hopefully you guys are familiar with that. Fresh press is one of the biggest processor of uh, you know, lettuce. And their scientists still you know, getting all these complaints about. And one person sent back and asking for refund. And that was organic romaine lettuce on a package. And it has one ladybug on it. And they want a refund because what there was a bug in it. And then the scientists will contact me and say, like, hey, would you mind confirming this? Is it a roach? Is it something that we should be confirmed? I'm like, wow, you know, I should be, I should be honored. If I have a ladybug in my, uh, knowing how pristine and how clean that lettuce is, the ladybugs are there, you know? So uh, yeah, I explained that to them and, and they actually, they give it a refund because this person was mortified by the fact that there's a bug. It doesn't really matter what it is, but that was a bug and it shouldn't be a bug. So those, those pressures are, you know, as a grower, sometimes I, I wear the, 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 the hat as a grower you, you face it and you're like, I handle two. I mean, I remember uh, a second rower doing my release with the, with the drones. It's like, are we gonna have issues with the rice holes? Because if I got complaints for the packing house, having rice holes on the product, we terminate this trial. And I was like, I didn't thought about that. So that would be a problem too. It's like, yeah. And if you have too many beneficials, that would be a problem too. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you saying? It's like, yeah. So it's-, yeah. it's those, those pressures are pretty interesting. They're good opportunities too to engage with the public. Yes. I had the same issue eating uh, organic romaine with my family and I had a lacewing larvae. It was in one of the bowls and everyone freaked out. And I was like, this is a good sign. Look at how good this lettuce is. Let's yes. just let it out. So yeah. Okay. We are starting to get some questions. Um, so the first question in the box here is uh, very interesting approaches. Could you talk a bit about differences in grower reception and adoption that you've experienced across these different locations and commodities? I yeah. would think organic vegetable producers in California would be very different than conventional ornamental growers in Virginia, but maybe yeah. not. Yes, they are. But uh, I, I slip it in my, in my presentation that I think one of the big drivers will be regulations of pesticides. And I'm, 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 I'm experiencing it right now. So organophosphates, for example, are the go-to for a grocery bean, but not anymore. So now the growers are like, Alejandro, you have all this technology, you know, it's kind of like, you've been in already in the future, you with the drones and all that, can we do something similar now that we lose in this? Can we look for that? So the reception, they're being receptive because they know that it's on the chopping block. And there, uh, it, it is likely that, that these chemicals are going to get. And, and then I show you guys those residues. I want my water to be clean. Everyone wants their water to be clean. We are responsible. So that plus the, re the regulations are pushing this boundary and, and actually asking us to think outside the box. And I'm so excited that we're going to live through this because, you know, they, they are becoming recept receptive. Sure, they, they, they're way different. You know, California growers or nine growers, sure. And then you have the premiums and a bunch of different things, economically speaking. But 
don't get me wrong, when there is a regulation at the federal level, it's for everybody, regardless of where you are. And now, what are you left? What are your alternatives? Can we look at our alternatives? What are those? Are we prepared? Are we ready? And the answer has to be yes. We should be investing on being proactive and trying to see, you know, let's start. The, the first line will be, what are the chemicals alternative to body drinking? So uh, let's try them out. No, because they're expensive. No, because we don't, we don't know how to use it. Well, let's learn about it. And then what's the next step? Can we bring new technology? Can we bring something that's going to help us? So that's the process that I'm following uh, just to be on, like, in front of that bell curve that is coming after us. So, exciting times. Yes. I agree. A uh, reminder that you can also ask to unmute if you would like. It looks like Ashley has her hand up. Did you want to unmute and ask? Hi, Alejandro. I hey, love Ashley. your presentation. It was awesome. And I can empathize on so many levels. So um, one of the questions I had, because I'm so impressed with your work in asparagus. So that's so awesome. You had these really novel approaches to pest management. Um, and I did a little bit of work in Michigan with asparagus growers. And for the majority of them, they would never be receptive to a lot of those approaches. And so this kind of comes from something you've alluded to in your presentation and kind of specifically discussed as well, which is kind of these social and almost cultural underpinnings to some of these production systems. And I'm wondering if you could comment on what those asparagus production systems were like. So were they always receptive to those types of pest management tactics? Is there something about the market down there that was driving the adoption? Um, stuff like that. But Thank you so much for the presentation. It was wonderful. Yes. So thank you. And, and that's, a, that's a great question. So what happened is when there is an economic driver. So back those growers, we got, you know, uh, Tesco and global GAP certifications. So the idea is that you have to prove on documents that you're reducing the use of, of pesticides. So we come up with all these ratios of things that you have to prove the audit that you are improving your pesticide usage. And then you get the certification. Plus you got a bonus and that it, it, it becomes money, right? And this is, you're talking about a company that 100% export. So I felt a little bit, it, it was a little unfair for us as Peruvians not getting the cream of the cream, the beautiful asparagus and almost organic, you know, and we cannot eat them because it gets 100% exported. But then, but then and, and when I came to the States for the first time, I'm seeing my company on, you know, on Safeway and Food Lion and all this different, and you, you see the Peruvian company that I work with, like, oh my God. So taking pictures of that and sending it to my previous, my former coworkers, it's like, oh, wow. Now here's the thing. For us back then, it was $2, uh, no, $1 a pound, including everything. Put it on the, on the so $1 a pound. And then we sell it here for four dollars a pound. So just taking it, just make make sure that the numbers are up. So that's a, a great, a huge incentive. I don't know about in, in, in probably Michigan's. They hate Peru. They know about Peru because that was one of the culprits that the market in the spike was just like sunk. Uh, but yes, I think you know those pressures on regulating use of pesticides, the economic value, and then the profits will drive those receptions and, and, and getting those implementations. I'm sorry, I keep, keep talking on and on and on. No, it's okay. She's Ashley just said, thanks for the answer. I figured that was um, one other thing I wanted to ask about while we wait and see if anyone else comes is um, the figure with the lettuce work where you were showing um, I think it was some efficacy trials of different products and the grower standard. And I saw that you had bee leaf on there. And bee leaf is a product that I'm really excited about, um, in particular for use in high tunnels, because it's so targeted in the mode of action. And um, so I'm curious, I wanted you to talk more about if that was one that you were trying to integrate or if it's something that growers have adopted and use and sort of your experience with that. No, belief was introduced. Uh, um, belief is, I, I believe, is the FMC. So there were some rebates here and there, uh, and then that's the other side, right? That we as scientists we don't get the, the politics and the and the uh, how did it works, you know? But belief is there, 
It's not widely used because what happened is, and I didn't put it here, but I ran some bios showing how long does it take. And believe, you know, takes at least 48, 72 hours just to see significant decreases on those bios because of, the, of, of, of how it works. But now you have a grower that 24 hours go and scout and see nothing and they're all alive. It's like, this is not work. So this misconceptions and trying to explain that to them every single time that I have a visit and they call me and say, hey Alejandro, we spray the belief that you recommend it. It's, it's not working. Like, how about you give it two more days? And if not, since we do the small plots, sometimes I had to say, I'll buy it. I'll pay for that. If you think that it's, it's, it's going wasted, we'll pay for that. Because the horse is like, oh my God, I'm not going to let you do anything to my babies. Because those are the letters were the babies. Uh, but yes, and, and luckily, you know, when we did 10 days after application, we noticed that reduction and we showed them that. And then at the beginning, it was like, ah, since you're the, the, you're the new guy, just, it was luck. Like, wait, no, I mean, I mean we have this protocol, this is standardized, we got to replicate it. Not only you, but there is 10 more sites that's just the same. Come on, man, what, what? So that, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Right, but and, but it, it was a great getaway. Of, of, I mean, a great way for me to learn the system, to be in close contact with them, learning about what the, you know, right. that the, the, the thinking about why I use this one and why I don't use this one, and then how can you have what science is gonna suggest when you say I'm sorry, Alejandro, but I have a palette of this product that I have to go through, and you're like, okay, all right, you know. So those kind of things help you guide those really applied questions and trying to fill those gaps in order to, so those bioessays, for example, were really, really straightforward, simple, replicated, you know, in few populations that we collected, and then we show them how they ask. And some of them were not as receptive, like, no, I'm not gonna risk it. No, that's too, that's, that's too long. So anyway, but yes, believe it's it's a great, I think it's a group nine and it's, it's a great, there's something coming up, uh, Similar, I think it's 9B, but there is something else. Uh, I think VSF is coming with a 9B, which is have a different things as well. So check that out. Those those are those are pretty good. Yeah, and so your answer to that really highlights the intricacies and the work that extension educators have to do, right? Because it's not just it's not just the science of look at here we reduce the population. Right, but it's that price point and it's that window of how that product is working and what you're looking for to evaluate it in the field and teaching the grower, especially yep. with trying to increase adoption of biologicals. Like yep. you have to allow for longer time for the product to do the job of killing and, and that the insect may look different or may never completely die, but just stay small. And it's exhausting, but fun. <laughs> Well, and, and that's, the, that's, that's the challenge. That's what I'm passionate about because we're, we're connecting those dots, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we come in and, and I call ourselves the facilitators, right? The ones that we connect those and we always looking for this replicated because I think that's the power. There is so many variables in a field that, that you, even though you want to do control it, you have to be aware of those things. And, 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 but then the beauty is that it's, it's the setup, it's commercial. Right? So it's, it's the ultimate goal that you want the science being reflected there and see how it's going to play it out. So that's, that's a big motivator. So anyway, but yeah, it comes with, you know, hands in your shoulders, like, dude, this is not how we do things here. So chill. All the way to, man, that's really cool. We need more, more research on that kind of thing, right? That, that's the whole, that's the whole spectrum. Yeah. Anyway. Awesome. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so we can let everyone go. Um, I know you have a meeting with the grad students coming up, so hopefully there they have an uh, opportunity to ask if anything comes up. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. For I wish you were me. here enjoying the snow, actually. <laughs> it would be better, but that's okay. Hey, it's, this, is the, this is the way we'll save and we'll be thankful for that. So. Thank you so much, Alejandro. We'll Good talk to you later. Bye. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.